recording. Richard Sharp, back in the studio after three years. 2018 was the first time you came, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. End you of 2018. Were, you were my first podcast when I started at my last job. So you're, book, you're bookending my charity career. I, I popped your cherry. You did. <laughs> <laughs> it was a real baptism of fire, that one. <laughs> yeah, 2018, that's it. 2018, then you flipping, you and Paul Godonis and a bunch of other people peer pressured me to in, in, join in uh, what is now React Disaster Response. Then went to Mozambique. We can, <laughs> Join the, join the Bay great. swimming team. <laughs> <laughs> which is great, which is great. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and here we are now. Right, question for you. Mm. I've, so I've said, I said it previously, I know when, uh, when you were there as the CEO of the charity, um, I would never want that job, like the hardest job in the world mm. ever, right? What's hard though? Being the CEO of a charity or commanding a company of men in Afghanistan? Been the CEO of a charity. You didn't even think about that, idea. Hundred percent. Now, you can ask me that hundred times; it'll be the same answer. Yeah. What's the challenge about it compared to being like a CEO of a of a of a, of a profit making organization? When you're so when you're commanding men in Afghanistan or men and women in Afghanistan, when you're a professional sports person, it's it's quite simple in a way because you you're dealing with people that are super driven, super motivated. All the resources you need are predominantly always there. You've just got to be brilliant at your basics and deliver brilliance every single day. But you're surrounded by brilliant people. When you're the CEO of a profit-making company, which you know I am again now, you're selling something. You, you know you have value to give to somebody at a price, and the price is right or wrong. But it's very transactional. And it's e it's much easier. I have this thing that you probably want. It's going to cost you this much. Is it worth that to you? Yeah, cool. Well, let's do the let's do the work. In the charity sector, you're 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 sort of you're trying to sell goodwill or you're trying to get them to put a price on their goodwill or their desire to act you're trying to constantly compel people to give money for no tangible outcome for themselves apart from the fact that they want to see good done in the world you're also as the ceo governed by you're not really the boss no you you are entitled but you have a board of trustees you have public opinion you have thousands of really passionately aligned volunteers that all have their own idea on what should and shouldn't be done. You've got staff, you know, it's, it's a very different exercise leading a charity. Um, and the press is always there, constantly. You know, the, the, the trust for charities was right down from when I was back at Help for Heroes even. Um, but the, the biggest thing is trying to constantly raise money without giving anyone anything in return, apart from the outcomes that we deliver somewhere else in the world. Yeah, and that, it's that that makes me that makes me think. You know, is this, there's no job I I wouldn't want less <laughs> kind of thing. Wouldn't want more. You know, yeah. is that is because you, it's the it's the it's the funding. It's like every single day, every single day you're fighting to get the money to be able to do what you need to do. Yeah, um, and we know oh we're doing great God. work. You know, I I used to get a ringside seat to watch the, the work you lot were doing in Mozambique or what we did in COVID. You know, we did some incredible stuff in COVID. Oh, we raised some money for that. But, um, you know, for three and a half, four years, I was waking up every night, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., freaking out about money. We were so close to going bust all the time. And I have slept like a baby for the last seven months because I'm selling a product now, you know, and people buy it. It's fine, you know. Um, and, yeah, three, four years of just constantly worried about money and where to get it from next. And um, Was it that bad? So, through, like, literally, waking in the middle of the night, I, I didn't sleep for you know, three and a half, four years. I was awake every single night about some kind of existential problem that we were going to have to navigate React through. This like little, we just lived with the chin, didn't we? Like we, we, we knew we had something to offer, and we just had to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until everyone else saw it and the money would come, which has now happened. Just in time for me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you find it? Do you, do you find it quite um, quite a lot of pressure on yourself anyway? Being continue to be your own boss and not and not being an employee, someone. I don't think I could have gone back to working for someone again. Um, you know, I, I think um, certainly in the early days, we had a lot of creative freedom to try and put it where we needed to put it and work with a very small, tight knit team to get it there. Um, that got harder as we got bigger and. The board got more involved and government as well. You know, it got, it got much harder to be creative. 
But um, the thought of going back now to be an ops director somewhere or, you know, anything but running my own shit now and and deciding my own destiny, I, I want to I wanna control my own life. Um, I want to build my version of an extraordinary life, not what everyone else says it should be. You know, I want to... I want to create what I think an extraordinary life should be for me. The work I want to do, where I want to do it, when I don't want to work, you know, when I want to do, I've got a lot of hobbies, you know, I want to make sure I'm working with someone that understands that. So my business partner's an ex-bootnet. He's like another high octane adventure guy. And we're going to do this our way. Um, and we're not motivated by a big exit in five, 10 years time. We just want to have a great time doing what we're doing and set ourselves up financially. But it's more important about the way we're going to do it and who we're going to do it with. Cool shit with cool people is the number one rule. Yeah, I think it's been quite an extraordinary life so far already, Richard. <laughs> time, time to chill out. Is it time to chill you out? You get mate? old, mate. <laughs> you get old when you let yourself get old, don't you? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, what, I'm, th- I'm only 38 now, mate. I've got, uh, oh, yeah? Yeah, I know. I look old, but I'm 38. Well, I'm 40 on Saturday. Are you? Yeah, on yeah. Saturday coming, yeah. Oh, happy birthday for Saturday, mate. I think um, while my body's still working... You know, well, I've still got the ability to do stuff. I want to keep trying new things. You know, I'm going to get my free fall license in January because um, I've never done that, you know, so I want to be a bit more like you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have got to keep active. And yeah, it's, it's one thing I'm, I'm realizing as well. But you, you've got to, uh, well, mentally active, physically active. But you do, uh, I, you got to try and temper it. I'm constantly injured at the minute. I, mm. I literally, this morning, I realized why. It's because I'm smashing myself. I'm doing, I'm not doing, you know, Spin class five days a week. I'm doing spin class one. Well, I'm going to spin class five yeah. once a week, but I'm also going boxing. I'm yeah. playing rugby, you know, and it's like, and I haven't done this stuff for four or five years to the level I'm doing it now. Yeah. And then I, I've well, literally I was walking out there this morning having a brew. I thought, that's why you're constantly injured because you're fucking hammering yourself. Yeah. You're not 23 <laughs> anymore. <laughs> know. Like, you know, you just launch yourself way back into it without even giving yourself sort of a, a, a period of, right, just ease myself in. No, box it twice a week, rugby, flipping, everything yeah. else is cane in it, mate. Right? You started jiu-jitsu, haven't you? I've just started jiu-jitsu, yeah. Because when I was in Dubai this summer, I was out there for three months. I was like starting to get the itch to play rugby again. I was like, I'm still in good shape. You know, I could go and go, I could still show these boys way around. I was doing a box jump and my shin swelled up. <laughs> I was like, maybe, maybe rugby is done for me. Maybe my years of that is done. But I needed something. I needed that like confrontation. I need that like, like face to face confrontation with someone. And I boxed a lot, but I don't want to keep getting like concussive injuries on the head. You know, there's, you know, seen a lot of rugby players getting uh, sort of brain injuries later on in life now. So, I think jiu-jitsu was the thing, and I, I'm in love with it already. I've only been three times. Mega. I love it. It's yeah. mega, isn't it? It is mega. Yeah, oh, I'm wait. going back tonight. Uh, where, where are you training? Uh, Ippon in Bournemouth. Okay. Uh, he's an ex, uh, he was on the Ultimate Fighter TV program way back when. Oh. Pro MMA guy, lovely guy. But he's a jiu-jitsu guy. What's his name? Uh, Jeff Lawson. Jeff okay. Ippon Lawson. Yeah, I wish I had the time dedicated to it. And I'm, I'm, Do you know what annoys me? Why don't Why don't more sports clubs, classes, jiu-jitsu, boxing, flipping, whatever you name it, do morning classes. All right. Well, this guy does. He does a 6.30. Oh, yeah. But that's the only reason I'm not getting into it. Right. Because it's where, where I live in Chelmsford, yeah. there's nowhere. To, oh, there's one class on a Friday morning at 6, 6 a.m. or 6.30 or something. Yeah. But the rest of the week, there isn't. Yeah, oh, yeah. The thing is with jiu-jitsu, you know, you've got to, you, well, you end up wanting to throw yourself at it yeah. constantly because it's brain work. Yeah, it's amazing. And I came out of the first couple of sessions like like two hours or an hour. I was like, I haven't thought about anything else apart from not getting strangled for an hour. <laughs> it's really good, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's mindful. Like aggressive yoga, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we need that edge to it, don't we? Yeah. yeah. It is good. It is good. Um, where you're training, do they let the, do they let the Joe Bucks do... Um, Leg locks and stuff. <laughs> I, haven't been, I haven't been there long enough to find oh, yeah. out yet. I'm still in like the white belt class. So it's all like nice and safe and insulated from the, the, the big mean guys. Yeah. <clears throat> but Jiu-Jitsu is big with bootnecks, isn't it? Really why, big. Why is a reorg. Well, I don't know. Like, but reorg has got massive. Um, and it's got very... But, but I think it was getting big before. I think it just... There was one of the PTIs. I think it's Sam Sheriff who set up reorg. He really drove BJJ in the core... And then lots of the course sort of legends got involved, and it just it just spread. But yeah, the bootnecks love it, love it. Yeah, there was a there was a class a class. It was it was going on in the sixteen brigade, but it was being run by a seven RHA guy. I can't remember. So no one went. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> Correct, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it probably, you're right, actually. It probably is Rio that's driven that, isn't it? And it, and uh, Tom Hardy's... Tom Hardy's in it. Mark Ormerod, obviously, he's really high profile and he's one of the real ambassadors. He's raised about a million quid for them in this last year doing... Like, he swam 5K. He's only got one arm. Yeah. He's swimming faster than I can. I can't swim for 5K. I've got two <laughs> arms, mate, <and> two <laughs> legs. Unbelievable. Um, did, oh, he's just said an award, isn't he? Yeah, Pride get? of Britain Award, I think. Yeah. yeah, he's an amazing geezer, isn't he? Amazing. I've not. Well, I'm trying to get on the podcast. I say trying. We, it's just meaning to sort it out and get it ready. Yeah. It's not happened yet. Not happened yet. Uh, I need to get down there, really. Mm. Yeah. What's the new company called? Uh, Challenger. Challenger Operations. Um, why did you, you call it that? <laughs> when, when, to be totally honest. Because you're a tank regiment background. Yeah, that's it. I'm, <laughs> I'm really passionate about armour fighting vehicles. <laughs> I was all about the armour. Yeah. Um, when Rob and I were, Rob and I had been shaping it for about 18 months. I was obviously still the CEO at React and we were pretty busy all that last year in COVID and we are trying to, trying to get the branding and things done because I was starting to plan an exit a little while out because I knew I couldn't, I couldn't sustain the pace that I was putting myself through at React. Um, but it took about 18 months and when it came to like branding it, the, uh, we had a little agency working for us, a mate of mine, and he kept sending us all ideas and I was like, yeah, mate, whatever. Like that sounds cool, and that was that was it. They they sent us Challenger and the logo. I'm like, yeah, cool, that'll do. That will just look. If we don't like it later, we'll change it. But actually, now we, we really like it. Like, we love it. It just fits with what we're trying to build and the kind of people we want to work with, um, and the way we want to do our business. Challenger just works. Yeah, you can go down a rabbit hole of branding, can't you? Yeah. You can either go. You, can, you you basically either need to choose something, go yeah, happy with that, or you make the mistake, I think, of going too much in depth. About how people will perceive this, that, the other part of the brand. Yeah. Have it now with with combat cigars. Oh, yeah. It's like you know, the, we've got a fourth cigar coming in, um, and de- deciding the name of that cigar, mate. Honestly, each one of us, the three of us behind the company, each one of us has thrown our our teddies at the pram multiple times. None of us will admit that though. Yeah, I've admitted now. Throwing teddies at the pram multiple times, <laughs> and and then we, you know, we've 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 chosen the the name of this cigar now. Center of Mass. Nice. Thank you. Love yes. that. Yes. Love that. They fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Love they, that. I know it's mega. Yeah. Isn't it? It's mega, right? But but it was one of a bunch of names. But the, the point I'm making is, we went round the houses trying yeah. to decide the name. It's like God, man. We were, we were all just giving it too much thought. You know, so we did the same thing with little things like the logo, which is a small part of the brand, right? Yeah. We did the same thing with the logo. We, we it just went bigger than Ben Hur. Yeah. Then we settled on the logo. And then, was it about six months ago? One of the guys was like, fucking logo shit. Like, we all decided on it. You <laughs> yeah. said it was good. Like, what are you talking about? You know, because your perception changes over time yeah. and things. Is going, but like you said, you can just change stuff. Needs to you be. can change. But you need to give it a soak period. Yeah. And, yeah. and Rob, Rob's super pragmatic as well. He's a Zimbo. Really pragmatic. Zimbo? Zimbabwean. Oh, yeah. right, 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 uh, right, right. But he's like uber Zimbabwean. Um, mega cool. Mega pragmatic. It's like... We don't need to worry about the fluffy stuff. He's like, do we like that? Yeah, let's do that. Because what we're going to set out to do might well change. It means the brand has to evolve. But actually, at the moment, we love it. You know, and uh, it's all about helping companies navigate from their strategy to their execution. And the the two L's in the Challenger are like a little maze. So like, it works quite nicely. And we want to build the place around ex warfighters, government consultants, humanitarians, doers, executors. So actually, Challenger just fits the kind of people we want to come and work for us. Mm. What, so how do you know, did you serve with Robin? Yeah. Is Rob? Robin's name yeah, Rob, Robin. Yeah, Robin Fearson. Uh, he and I were 4-2 Commando together back in 2010, just before I deployed on 14, I think. Um, so he was one of the company two ICs there. And I just know, we weren't like best mates back in the call, we were good mates. We actually met um, fighting naked over a broomstick in the mess. It was like love at first sight. We were at the front of the uh, the naked chain wrestling over the broomstick. He kicked me in the he kicked me in the plums to get the kick the stick off me. Um, but obviously for the last year we've, we've been inseparable. Um, as we as we sort of found founded Challenger. What was he doing before then? Um, so Rob he left the core similar time to me, and he's done some really interesting stuff. But he was working for um, different U.S. and U.K. government entities doing stabilization activity in predominantly sub-Saharan Africa, um, Somalia, Sudan, Niger, Turkey, Syria, you know, he was evacuating people during the siege of Aleppo, um, created marauder forces in Mozambique to get up into the north um, to, to quell the insurgency, all DFID money or USAID money 
uh, implementing big complex projects and programs in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So he's done that for 10 years. Um, and the idea as we came together was he had all this experience working for UK, US government, and he had all that front end business, the big, the big houses that deliver that work. I was at React with this quite large audience of people like you and the other responders who would make ideal consultants for that. And also like, at that time, my LinkedIn reach was quite big. <laughs> he was like, we could bring these two parts together and create our own consultancy house to go and implement these projects. So we would start bidding onto the uh, Combat Stabilization Fund, um, predominantly onto that actually, uh, to deliver these really difficult projects with the people like where I was trying to take React. You know, we will go where others can't because of the people we can recruit and the people we can train. So that was the genesis of Challenger. It like it sort of it moved away a little bit, and we've just we're in complex project delivery at the moment. Well, I've just been in Dubai. He's doing a tech transformation in London. Um, but it starts to come back actually, and we're looking now again back into the Congo and South, and and some work we might be able to do there. Um, working with different companies that are trying to to open new business lines there. It's really difficult to operate down there. Um, What's going on? What's I mean, if you've got, a, I'm guessing you may have a handle on it. What's going on with the the um, influx of Chinese influence in Africa, Central mm. Africa? Is that is that a thing that's happening, or is it or not? Because <clears throat> I've heard it a few times now in the inverted commas, China, China own Africa. Mm. You know, this snuggling their way in in business. You know, sort of a different method of. <sighs> Controlling influence over the mm. what traditionally be you know more military oriented or yeah. more over you know um, is there yeah is there is that causing any issues over there business wise? Well, it's like what did that continent need? It didn't need more colonization, did it? <laughs> and yeah, but Ch <laughs> China's been buying up the the East Coast for a, for quite a long time now because you're right, their foreign policy, ours and the Americans were always built around hard hard force wasn't it hard force have soft power whereas china's is built through economic influence and yeah certainly down that east coast they've they've brought up huge chunks of it it's interesting to see now the the uae is starting to buy up or starting to get involved <coughs> in, in the west because as people have countries all over the world that have energy and food uh, sustainability issues and the uae is no different and they're now trying to fle flex their muscles into west africa a bit um, for their own sustainability issues. So it's just another player in the space. And of course it makes more compl complex. Why the interest in West Africa? What's the, what, what, what are the resources there they're after? Um, I don't know. I actually, I don't know. Um, I, I need to look at it more because we're not really interested in West Africa at the moment. But it's, it's all around energy and food. Um, you know, the UAE doesn't have rain. <laughs> so it doesn't, it can't have agriculture. Um, so their food has to come from somewhere else. They're looking at new ways to create artificial farming um, to sort of, um, what do you describe? It's it's uh, basically to grow beef that's not S beef. Synthetic beef. Synthetic beef. Yeah. Um, mm. Because they, they've got huge issues um, with their long term sustainability because they don't have water. Yeah, they're not in the greatest part of the world to survive. Are they? That's like, right. And they're like building all the time. You know, these massive skyscrapers. It's a it's an incredible place to be. It's like being in the future. But you're like, oh, how sustainable is this? I'm not sure. I like it there. <laughs> I do like it there. Um, Short period of time, I do, but yeah. not. It's a strange place. Yeah. It's very, very, you know, cl clinical. If that's the right way to describe it, it's like you, e you either, you know, you know, in terms of, like, just culturally and sort of ways of life and, pa and pattern of life and stuff. Here in the UK, you can, you know, you either in the house. You, or you're out in the lash, but there's mm. an in-between. You can pop over and see a friend. You can, yeah. there's sort of a lot of in-betweeny in social aspects you can have. When I was in Dubai, so I've been a few times for a few weeks at a time. Not as much time as you spent out there, but there didn't seem to be that in-between because everything's so far apart mm. and everything's so, it's like, it's very formal. So if you're going to go and do something social, it needs to be organized. Or, and if you're not doing something organised, you're in the house on your own kind yeah. of thing. It's weird, I didn't like it. I think what I found out there was, because um, there's, really, there's a really big group of bootneck expats out there, all working for Shamal and, and Gal. And so I, th I think there was like these pockets of community, because um, Dubai's all broke up into these different cities, like Motor City, Sport City, Marina. And I think in those, you get these enclaves of community, where it's more like what you described, because I, I fell in that in the last sort of half of my time out there, and that was really cool. Because then, actually, it was just going to see people at their pool, 
nip in the golf course for a few beers or like a long boozy lunch, then back to someone's house. So I could see it there. Um, so I, but I think it's in pockets. Mm. Um, but you're right, it's massive. It's all spread out. Everything's a 14 lane highway. <laughs> you can't walk anywhere really. Um, it's a bit more like living in London, but just with massive highways everywhere. Is that where you see yourselves HQ in, Challenger? Dubai? No, no, we'll always be in England. I think um, we've got some conversations going on at the moment I can't, I can't say too much about at the moment, but that will see us opening an entity in Dubai to be able to operate from there um, and potentially one in South Africa as well to be able to operate from there. Um, but yeah, home will always be the UK. Challenger will always be a UK company as well um, because most of the people we're going to want to employ are f- from, from here, I think. You see yourselves getting involved in the anti-poaching side of things in Africa, or are you already going down that? Way? Um, we would absolutely, because you know the the genesis of the company was to to support NGO projects. That's where we that's where we started our thinking. Um, and I know uh, James Glancy and Rob Simpson that run uh, Veterans for Wildlife, and um, obviously Mike Brewer that from React, super involved with them. And I've been chatting to them over the summer, actually, just giving them some advice on where we were as Team Rubicon all the way back when, because that's sort of where they're at now, this sort of juncture of having to slightly restart, <coughs> find money, employ a full-time CEO. Um, and for the right projects, yeah, we would definitely get involved in anti-poaching. We still want to do, I still want to do good things in the world. Um, I don't want to completely leave the charity sector behind. I just want to do it in a, in a for-profit sense now. Mm. That's another, uh, I mean, oh, the reason I ask about the, anti- the anti-poaching side, is that seems to come to the, the forefront of, just attention at the m- over the last few years for some for a reason I can't work out. Mm. I don't know why. Don't know why. There was some there was some um, there was some pretty alley gigs going on, wasn't there? A few years ago, where there was just parrots and bootnecks going out hunting poachers to start with. I think that's why everyone fell in love with it because it was like, it was really Gucci, wasn't it? <laughs> but I think it's become more it's become more uh, regulated and proper now, and it's more about capacity building and and training rangers to deliver and doing investigations and handling evidence. It's, it's much more professional now, isn't it? I think not just a load of ex-soldiers running around with uh, long-range rifles. <laughs> not, yeah, not only that, it's other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got armory checks now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. I so I'd enjoy getting involved in that, I think. Just, yeah. Just, just generally, because it's like uh, yeah, it's saving the animals, man. And it's, it's good fun doing it. Yeah, I've actually been thinking, because I... Whilst I'll, I'll never work for another charity again, um, I still want to do some stuff. I'll be looking at volunteering for the RNLI and get on the lifeboat crew because it's still something mega worthwhile. It's still exciting, you know. Like some of the stuff we did at RAT was super exciting, wasn't it? Um, I think anti-poaching work would be really exciting. Um, but at first, I've got, to, I've got to build this business before I've got yeah, to take off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did that first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where am I going to go with that? Where am I going? What was I going to say, Sharpie? <laughs> mate, this is your show. <laughs> I'll need to answer the questions. Yeah, I've had a brain fart, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. 150 episodes and you're still running out of questions. It is, uh, yeah, 150. Um, what, what episode were you? Oh, God, I don't know. I must have been one of the, the early ones. It was yeah, the 30s, yeah, yeah, wasn't yeah. It? I think it was one of the early ones. Yeah, yeah, I was just before Johnny Mercer. I think he was a couple of episodes after me. Okay. That that first one with you, I'm, I'll laugh at myself on that one. <laughs> I'll laugh at myself yeah. on that one. When I think back, you go, you know, you, <clears throat> you know, like, I, I, <clears throat> so I've learned, I say I've learned how to do this as time <laughs> gone on. I've just had a complete fucking brain just fart. The first time I've had to say anything, it. mate. <laughs> no, but I laugh at myself because uh, I think back and you go, right, you, you know, you like critique yourself, you, you're interviewing the CEO of a charity and you talked about that. You brought that up as a, <laughs> a, a talking point. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm on about, don't you? I know you know exactly what I'm on about. Think, before what I, were you doing? Before I came up here last night, I, uh, <laughs> or before I came up this morning, last night, I got a quick look at the headlines to see if there was anything really, <laughs> really, really contentious that you might try to put me to the sword on just so I could have some, some pre-prepared lines to take. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm, more sen- I'm, yeah, I'm more sensible now. It's like, you, you know, I don't, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't want to... You know, it's open conversation like we're having now. Yeah. But lessons like I learned on that podcast, you know, I didn't cause it. It, it was, if you look at it from the perspective of, okay, is there anything from Richard's perspective as a CEO of a charity, <laughs> is there anything that could be, you know, misconstrued in that podcast that maybe isn't necessarily the best thing to talk about when you think about from a charity perspective? Yes, you <laughs> fucking idiot. What are you doing? 
It's like, sc- it's like screw the nut for the guest is what yeah. it is. It's like, what are you fucking hey, talking about? Anyone uh, listening is going to have to go back and look that one up for themselves now. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, question for you. Afghanistan. Mm. Want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. What do you think about the situation that's unfolded? Nice open question there for you. Because well, yeah. I couldn't ask you the, was it all worth it? Oh, yeah. I haven't quite figured out that I think, that's been, I think that's been well covered by everyone else isn't it um, I, was, I was in Dubai as that all unfolded and I'm glad <laughs> I was not here um, and why is that? because I just felt and I, this might be an unpopular opinion I just felt that the veteran community en masse and we're all different right but we're all different but I just thought the way the press latched onto it I thought we bore our ass a little bit I thought like <sighs> When we went there, back in 2006, 2011, 2009, I certainly don't remember as being all about the kids and education. And I remember as being drilled to go and fight an enemy, right? I remember as loving doing that, you know? I remember having really bad days, but I also remember as loving that. And uh, that was what we did, that's what we trained for. And I remember all the FOTs at the time were us sitting in Sangers covered in link and covered in gun oil. And then in the news, every picture was people surrounded by women and kids. And I, I don't remember that part of the conflict so well. And it was awful the way the West ran away and created a humanitarian crisis now, which is really r- unsolvable, probably, because we could probably never re-enter the country. Um, was it probably always going to happen, potentially? You know, were we ever going to find a way to withdraw from Afghan and them to be able to sustain themselves? when no one else has ever succeeded there in the history. I don't know. Um, but was it was I getting triggered by the, the views of, uh, by the sight of the country falling? No, I wasn't. You know, was I thinking, oh my God, what a waste of my life? No, I wasn't. You know, I, I felt at the time, me and everyone I served with did our shift, and did our best in that shift. What happens in politics that we can't control? No point bleating and worrying about it it's, it's out of my sphere of control what was in my sphere of control was those six months at a time in very small grid squares at a time and i did my best in that bit it's for someone else to do the rest and if that falls apart you know i i'm fine with it you know yeah you uh, yeah um i got asked the question this morning on a, on a interview, interview i did this morning for this and it was that I think it was that open question, like what what do you think about what's gone on in Afghanistan this year, and I, I'm the same with you. It's how how if you it's how to reconcile it, right? Because you, we have to accept that. What well, we do have to accept that there, you know, I'm of the same opinion of you. Okay, I can like I understand it, but it, is, it wasn't triggering me when it was happening. No, you know, but there are people who you know that we know uh, potentially who yeah. The, the, the loss of their friends and stuff had a fucking profound effect, had a profound effect on them like it does everyone, mm. but a profound effect where they're looking at the situation in Afghanistan and just it's thrown up. You yeah. know, what the fuck are we doing? A lot of anger, yeah. which is completely understandable. I think <clears throat> in terms of reconciling, reconciling and understanding the was it all worth it question. Well, if you if you if you go down the the route of looking at it from too high a level. At the campaign level, over all the years we were there, what did we achieve? Were we, in inverted commas, successful? Mm. And that, well, you can't answer that question because th- we don't know what the definition of success there was for ourselves, no. right? So, you, exactly like you said, I look at it on a low level. What was my personal impact mm. in that place when I was there? Was it generally good po- and positive? You know, generally for the people that I, I impacted when I was there, the, mm. the, the local, you know. For, I was going to say Taliban, then. Yeah. the Afghans when I was there. You yeah, know? Um, and I think the answer to that question is yes. Mm. And but there's a bunch of things p- plays into that. It's it's one is my impact on those people that I influenced there. Two is my own conduct. Was I was I doing things for the right reason? Mm. Was I moral at all times? Was I ethical at all times? Was you know. All those pieces, and if and the answer to that piece is yeah, I I was doing things for the right reason, making the right decisions, not making poor decisions because I was out there for a fucking jolly and I didn't care about anyone else's yeah. lives. So doing for the right reasons, and I think we had a positive impact. And got no issue. Yeah, I've got no issue. You can <clears throat> the other way to look at it is 
ignoring this, this definition of success that we don't know what it was, it kept moving the goalposts, but what, what were we trying to achieve in the end? You know, um, if you if you ignore that and look at and ask the question, is Afghanistan, is the situation now better than what it would have been if we'd never been there for the last 20 years? Mm. In, if we had never been there for the last 20 years or whatever it was, right, um, I don't think the Taliban would be as they are now. Now, they obviously are still being flipping lunatics in the streets, and or, or they, they, they seem to be going back to their old behaviors and said they weren't, but there's they, they're definitely more, there's more room for communication with them. Mm. There's more room for compromise with them because they're now acting as a legitimate political entity, mm. which opens the doors to the possibility that we can influence their behavior in that country in a way other than, other than the military way, which mm. maybe wouldn't have been the case if we hadn't been there for 20 years. Be, that hand has been forced. They've had to do that. Mm. That's the way they've had to go. So they may still be, you know, the, the effects of the campaign uh, m may still be yet to be seen mm. in 10, 15, 20 years' time. Yeah, time will, time will tell on that. Um, what the 20 years certainly did was by the West, 20 years of relative peace on its homeland. You know, post 7-7, you know, the, by closing down Afghanistan as an insurgents training playground, it meant their ability to project force into the West was, was kept shut after 7-7. I mean, that was definitely success. Um, we'll see how much long-term success that has, that has going forward. Um, and... I, th I I look at it like you from a more junior level, and that was it worth it? I don't think as a junior officer, you know, I might be able to like talk about it with my mates in the mess and stuff. And but as a junior person in the in the military, that's not necessary for us to question. When you join the military, you become part of that toolkit to deliver foreign policy. You know, you're a, you're a tool to get policy done. You don't get to influence the policy itself. I don't think. Now that uh, in this world where we're all much more enlightened and much more engaged from a much younger age in all politics, that might not necessarily be a popular view. It might be an old school view. Um, it's definitely how I feel though. And when it's the press s like skews everything as well because they latch into certain parts of a narrative. They latch into certain parts of the story and amplify it. And what they latched into was the effect this was having on the veterans community and how, because you're right, some of the things that happened to all of us have had profound effects. And of course, it will. when you see things like that, it's going to have horrible, profound effects. But just, I felt that the press did what they did in 2010, 11 again, and they made us all look like we're broken and that this con that we're victims of the conflict and we're not. Like, we're just not. The best people I ever met were in the military, and they're outside crushing life. Of course, we're all living with that experience, and some of us have to live with really negative side effects of that experience. But what, what we did again in that bubble, what the press did was make the veteran community look like this fragile, weak, broken entity. And that's what I mean by that we bore our ass again, because that doesn't do anything to empower the community. That doesn't do anything to help veterans get employed after the military it doesn't do anything to strengthen all of the skills and experiences we have because yes it was traumatic sometimes but those traumas those experiences make us who we are which make us so much more effective in other walks of life that, uh, with people that out those experiences can't have but the press loves the loves the pity narrative and unfortunately it amplifies parts of the community that strengthen that as opposed to other parts of the community which show that yeah, look, that was honking, but that was then, and this is now. And look at what this community goes on to deliver outside. Because the veteran community, I think, is a huge asset to the country. Huge. But I, I think, and I, when I was at React, I was trying to show that all the time, and just what veterans could do for the country. Um, and I think in COVID, we certainly showed that. But um, every opportunity the press gets, um, and the social media algorithm seems to latch into it as well, we amplify, the, I think, the wrong part of of our community we shouldn't ever get rid of it because we have to support people but it's not it's not everyone no you're right yeah that that blanket sweeping victim mentality thing that we either yeah you're right mate that we either label with or and or people it, it, allow the label they accept it but this is but part of that is because it's a fucking attention thing it's just it's the worst like it's the worst thing you you, you i'm agreeing with you. <clears throat> you know you 
I would dread to think that I ended up getting a getting a job somewhere, you know, in the future or whatever, or, or just benefiting from something uh, because out of sympathy instead of merit. Yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, he just got given it because oh, he's a, he's an ex-military and yeah. Oh. I think that's a hugely damaging narrative, and it's been going on for too long, and it. The only thing that can change it is all of us. <laughs> it, the only thing that can change it is the community, whatever the community means. Because every veteran is different, isn't it? Every service is different. Every cat badge is different. We all serve different times. We all see different things. You can't just call us all veterans and think we're all the same, you know, because no, no one person is the same as the next. But the only, th the only way we can fix that narrative is as a group um, and to stop using that as our mouthpiece um, and stop seeking validation for what we served by how much we suffer. Like, I, I think it became, for a while, to, to demonstrate the level of your service, you had to demonstrate the level of your suffering. And that, I think, is damaging as well. Because actually, you can have done incredible service, you can be an incredibly professional soldier with incredible conduct, and you might not have a mental health problem afterwards. That doesn't mean your service was any less valuable than the person that does. And I, I think that dichotomy was becoming hard to navigate for people. Mm. Very interesting. It also, it also that that victim mentality. It can, it can be an inhibitor to your own improvement, progress. You become, mm. you become. You know, if you, if you are using that, Im you know, that impacting yourself, that suffering mm. from from your part in the in whatever campaign, whatever conflict, whatever operation, whatever arm of the military you're in, uh, uh, if you're using that label or that that as a as a way of getting attention mm. or to achieve an aim online, mm. it's something you can never move past, and then you're always that sick person. Yeah, I deleted Facebook in the summer, but the best thing I ever did. Um, because you're just you're absorbing all this stuff by osmosis, and I find it really frustrating. But once you label something, you can you can disconnect from the accountability. My wa my wife taught me this. She's a teacher, or she was a teacher. She runs a charity of her own now, and uh, she has this wicked saying that it might not be your fault the reason you are you are, but it's your responsibility to deal with it because no one else is going to. And when they you know that she she specialises in uh, troubled schools, trying to get better in areas of economic depression. She came out of central London schools, that kind of thing. And um, <coughs> children very young using class A drugs because uh, it, it was readily accessible to them. She said they don't drink as much as probably we did when we were kids. We were all trying to get cider and get another part. But they are using class A drugs. And schools would label them drug addicts at 12, 13. You know, maybe they'd done some cocaine or they'd done some ecstasy. And they would label them very quickly a drug addict. But she said, then what that does for that child is it takes away all the accountability because it's got a label. It's a victim of an addiction. And actually, that child has to learn to take responsibility for its actions. Um, and so do we. And once you label things, and once you become a victim, you sort of, well, it's not my fault anymore. It's not my responsibility to solve this problem. And actually, we're the only people that can solve our own problems in reality. Yeah, do you know what? That's a hard pillow. That's a hard pillow. <laughs> it's a hard, it's a hard pillow. pillow to swallow that one. <laughs> <laughs> It's a hard pill to swallow for people like this. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, and I, I learned that with my dad when, you know, he's a, he's a recovering alcoholic now. Um, I used to be a flipping, a very, very good at being an alcoholic, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and I remember listening to him on your podcast a while ago. Yeah. yeah. And he, so one of the things I learned, you know, when he was, when he was, um, an alcoholic was that it's an illness, you know, it's, it's, it's an illness. Mm. It's a, fucking illness in the brain yeah you know but like you said it it it's for him to take a step forward and do something about it you know mm. we tried everything everything to try and get him to stop drinking the way he was drinking and uh, i give up in the end i give mm. up in the end because i again i realize there's nothing we can't do anything at one point i was going to kidnap him mm. i was going to put i was going to bundle him into my car and drive him to Colchester where I was living at the time and he was going to live with me mm. and I was there and there'd be no alcohol in the house. Mm. That, that's the point was that. And then my mother wouldn't have taken that very well. So it didn't happen. <laughs> and in the end, he ended up, you know, a, a, a uh, near-death experience because of his drinking mm. and um, it enforced cold turkey in hospital. And now he's a, you know, that's that's what had to happen because, yeah. because he couldn't make the decision to sort himself out. Mm. But because of the illness, but, yeah. all, but you know, that... 
it goes at that point it goes beyond a willpower thing it becomes a you know it's like fucking can't fucking do it because he's constantly mentally compromised but it's the same with anything it's the same with mental health you know um when i was when i was at my worst it, it only got that far with me because i wasn't i wouldn't make the decision to go and get help yeah is what it is and when i did it was it was again that point of you the, you have to do it you have to it's you Every, everything it all comes down to the decision on the person yeah. and anyone that says otherwise is bullshit mm. the only time it doesn't is when someone's in a flipping coma or someone is you know unconscious and they can't make the decision but every other time there has to be a decision for yourself to yeah. accept help seek help yeah, that's what i think anyway yeah. and it's not an, people don't like hearing that no. but i think it is the case um, and, and I'm not an expert in, or I've got no expertise whatsoever in, in mental health and the illnesses around that and how hard that must be to get help. Where I sort of focus my attention is on that middle bracket of the community that have created this narrative that we just don't fit in society anymore. Veterans, I oh, come out, civvies don't get us. They're, they're, they're detaching from their accountability to make themselves a civilian. And, you know, they, when we come out into this world, we have to start again in many ways. We've got all this great skill. But we also, we have to be accountable for the fact that we don't really know anything about the outside world. And it's not on them to adjust for us. We have to adjust <laughs> to fit into this world. Otherwise, as, we've, as we, what we have seen, I think, is if you don't fit, then we can really start going down quite a negative path. And that's when we can start creating our own mental health problems because we suddenly feel completely lost, don't we? And like, We don't belong anywhere and our identity's gone and no one gets us. And, yeah, uh, it's that sense of entitlement, isn't it? Mm. And you become a bit of a twisted person mm. who's just... A toxic corner of of the military community yeah it's I think, um, um I remember talking to uh to gaz from Sinita's guild who had been doing some work with one of the ladies in the states and they're talking about the dysfunctional vet and like there, there was like there was an identity building in the states of the dysfunctional vet that sort of bearded baseball cat wearing sits in the club bar won't stare at anyone thousand but it's like they were creating a caricature of themselves because being the dysfunctional vet was becoming almost desirable. And he said, like, he thought that that was going to be the way we would follow. We tend to follow the States, don't we? <laughs> a couple of years behind. And and that isn't desirable. Now, that's not what I think of our veteran community. I don't see us all as broken and twisted and un unable to settle into, into civilian life. Yeah. It'll be hard to get away from though, because I mean, you mentioned social media earlier. You mentioned the news; it it works for them. You get, get, yeah. c creates discontent, creates arguments, gives a perception that there's something wrong somewhere in society. It needs to be fixed, mm. and it should be fixed by someone else. You know, and like you, you know, like you said, it's it's the worst. It's the it's the worst possible way the military community be, could be could be perceived. Mm. There's so much potential in in who we are and what we can what we can do. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those. It's one of those hard subjects that people don't talk about very often because it's hard. Because actually, you can open yourself up to quite a lot of criticism because it sounds like we're being uncaring and unsympathetic. And um, uh, actually, really far from it. And I've spent seven years working in military charities, um, but those charities should be focused on the people that really need the acute care. That have got really big problems, or not even the acute care. They just need the 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 the, the, the like slight touch on a tiller at the time. I, d I just I don't think the whole community is broken and triggered and vulnerable. I think actually the majority of the community is just really quietly getting on with life. Um, in various jobs, from Inmarsat to charities to building sites to you know they're everywhere, just doing the work, just quietly getting on with their lives. Mm. Yeah, it'd be alright. I wonder if it'll. I wonder if it'll peter out that this. Yeah, I wonder if the uh, that victim mentality and the, and everything we've just been talking about will peter out as we get f as we get further down the line away from Afghanistan. Yeah, as the as the younger generations start to leave the military now, who who won't have been away on those tours, it probably will. It will dilute and it will because those those people will be coming out probably having not been to a. A conflict anywhere you know hopefully for them yeah you say hopefully i don't know it, it's like the, the, the military's in a like a shit place now i think 
it's peaks and troughs, isn't it? Of pe- you have peaks and troughs of campaigns and operations, um, and that's peaks of activity. Mm. And in those peaks of activity, recruitment and retention are generally quite high. And then when those campaigns and operations drop off, or those periods of time, those those periods of high in, high frequency ops drop off, then you go into a trough of. Well, you get retention recruitment issues. You get a you lose a wealth of experience because mm. all the people that done all that stuff they end up leaving. Saw it after you know after the Afghan campaign, saw it after the Iraq camp, campaign, or, or up certain certain. Operations when you, when you go out there, you know when you when you came back from your first Afghan tour, probably probably noticed there was like senior senior people, experiences from senior toms to screws between sergeants. They would just leave because it's sort of done it. It done the trick. Yeah. After the '06 tour, we had a massive you know, '07. We had a massive problem. Mm. So many people left because they'd been there and done it, and they're like, right. Gone. NCP was paying hundreds and hundreds of hundreds. NCP, a day. that's a good and point. Maritime actually. security as well. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that is a very good point. But you probably know for another five, ten years of, of absolute dross experience in the military, mm. like it was in the nineties, with the exception of the Gulf War. Yeah. And some small operations, you know, in um in the Eastern Bloc and uh, the Balkans and yeah. places like that. Well I'm I'm well out of touch with what the military's doing. I mean even the Marines, I don't really understand the units now and how they're laid down because they've all been split into separate little task groups and so that I'm not even close to the core anymore. I guess it's just in that transition period. It's becoming what the army needs to be for tomorrow, as opposed to what it was yesterday. And you're right; it will. I think it will probably completely change the demographic of people that join it. I think when we, you know, if we're in the British Legion in 20 years' time and our blazer and our cap badge on, you know, looking at people leaving the military, then they're probably very different to the kind of people we joined with. Because I just, it is in a transition period. It will become. War fighting, I think, is going to change. I always said it wouldn't because it's always going to need. At the end of the day, there's always going to have to be somebody where they call it where the metal meets the flesh, and that will probably never go away completely. But I think the emphasis will shift. It won't be the majority of what they're doing. I, I think, but I'm not. Shift. I'm not that close. So shift to where? Into information, into um, autonomous vehicles, into internets of things that move in swarms and are linked by sensors to ground troops. And I think the human will always be the decision maker. But I think where the the metal meets the flesh. Actually, it might be metal meeting metal, um, much more than metal meeting flesh. Mm. Slightly off topic. Mm. Submarine service have got a massive uh, retention problem at the minute. Yeah, so I was speaking. I was speaking to a friend on. Uh, are you aware of it? No. Are you aware of it? I was speaking to a friend who rang me out of the blue. Actually, I haven't seen him for twenty years. Anyway, he's forty-five years old and currently enlisted in the submarine service. <laughs> he's X three para, right? He's X three para, and he he he. Then he went to the PT Corps, and then he got out, did maritime security, then he joined the MPGS. Hates that. Mm. Bumped into a bumped into a, an old colleague in Aldershot, and who is now in the Navy. And the guy said, "You can transfer to the submarine <laughs> service. No, you can transfer to the Royal Navy for MPGS. He's forty five. Right? Yeah, what? Yeah, you can because it's classes." Part of the services, so you're right. not you're not getting in at 45. You're already in. It's right. like you just transfer in within we we branch. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said for one caveat, well, two caveats. You've got to be a medic. You've got to come train as a medic and submariner. He's gone. Yeah, fuck it. But the retention problem is being caused by so they, they haven't got a recruitment problem. They got young sprogs or whatever you call them in the navy joining mm. up to the submarine service. Then they're going on the subs as that can now go down. You know, go underwater for stay down for longer and longer periods. Mm. They were saying the big, the big, the big bombers now, like six months at a time. Oh, no. under. and the the younguns <laughs> can't handle being off comms, mate. Can't handle being no access to WhatsApp, internet, yeah. and all that for that period of time because they're so they've been so reliant on it all their life. I wonder if I could be now. I wonder if I'm so reliant on it now. No, like we. I think we say we we all we all blame the uh, the youngins now, don't we? But we've all changed. Like society has fundamentally changed. I'm pretty sure if I if I had to, yeah, you could put me underwater for six months. I don't think I'd choose it. <laughs> you know, like, that's a long time in a dark metal tube under the ogin, not being able to talk to anybody apart from the person you're sharing. You're not even sharing bunks with. You're sharing a bed with them. You're hot yeah. mattressing. Yeah. Like that's uh, 
maybe I'm not that hardy anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I don't fancy that. Um, but uh, we're, we're all super connected all the time, aren't we? I, I've tr I try, I do now try and reduce it massively. Mm. So one of the things I noticed over the last couple of years is if I spend prolonged time on my phone, doing whatever, like we're all doing, just doing shit on my phone, yeah. right? My level of attention and, and, and ability to focus plummets me. Yeah, no. It Seen. plummets. Seen. It's terrible. And now I, I've got an app on the phone now, and it's, uh, it's a pain in the ass sometimes. It's called Freedom um, on, on Android. And um, I can only access, so I select what apps I'm allowed to access all the time, right. which is Gmail, Google Maps, or banking apps. That's it. Right. Everything else from the browser through to games, whatever, I can only access five minutes of every hour. All right. So it's from like 11 a.m. to 11.05, which is great until you rock up for a flight <laughs> on Ryanair and you need to log in into your Ryanair account to, to show them your yeah. boarding pass and you've got to wait another 47 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and your missus is going, what? <laughs> maybe, maybe unlock your browser, mate. <laughs> yeah. But it makes a massive difference. I yeah. Could, uh, yeah a and, and since I started being more disciplined with the phone, I, I started reading again. Mm. Like, whole paragraphs at a time, Sharpie. No without, without Your missus is helping you, though, isn't she? <laughs> She's breaking them down. Yeah, I started reading again, you know. Th uh, it's... And I, that's an, another thing I could, partly because I found other stuff, just I wasn't able to fucking read. Literally, yeah. I couldn't get past a couple of lines of my wine, my wine, my wine, my mind one. Mate, 100, episode 150 is going pear shaped. Oh, I mate, can't yeah. my words. I'm flipping, my mind's going blank. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> no, the phone's a big one. I, I find it. So I'm not like, I do read, but I have to really make myself read because my mind does wonder. I'm also not very good at like really deep work. I'm very good at being dynamic with people and connecting to problems and solving problems on the fly. But I'm, I'm trying to sit and um, define some of the challenges, products. And it's quite deep work. I've got to really concentrate and I've got to write and I've got to take what's in my mind. And, and I've got to sort of, I've got to analytically think about my own development and then get it into a clear, concise definition. That's hard for me. That's not really how my brain works. And yet I have to make sure I've got no distractions because otherwise I'll just then pick up my phone and like, you know or get on slack and chat to Rob you know I just it does like it eats attention mm. eats attention one thing I've noticed though is it's not the same with with my kids so I was mm. really when I was when I was realizing you know in the last few years god this is really has a bad impact on me with my phone I was worried about the kids because they've got phones obviously yeah I'm thinking oh my god and but what I've noticed with them they both. I've got two daughters, and they're, they're both different the way they use the phones. But it definitely doesn't have the same Im mental impact on them, and they can take it or leave it. Right. You know, they can they can they can be on it for hours at a time. Mm. Other times they won't. They're, they're not. It's they they're not they're not completely addicted to it. Okay. In the way that we are. You, you, you see, that's the worst thing in the world when you see like a mum or a parent, mm. and they they sat with a kid, for example, and the the parent is just on their phone yeah. scrolling through, you know, and the kids are sat there, you know, that kind of, or when you see two people out on a date and they're not talking to each other, just they're sitting at the table together, but they're just mental. <laughs> yeah, it's mental. It? It's mental. mental. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, it is mental. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm quite, I'm, I think I'm pretty good with it. I'm pretty good at leaving it in my pocket. Um, especially if I'm out with people, like I'm pretty good at being engaged in the conversation, but if I'm sitting on my own trying to work and it's on the table, that's when I can be like, because I don't want to be doing the work. I can just sort of drift off and pick it up. Yeah, but you know what you're missing there, though? This is a big part of why I got the app as well. Mm. Is you're, missing, you're missing your, well, you may probably, you may do it in other ways, the being alone your thoughts time. Yeah. We don't, none of us have that anymore. We used to sit at a bus stop. Yeah, you know, right. you, Everyone used to have the opportunity to sit at a bus stop or doing something mm. when phones didn't exist. And you're just there in your own mind. You're yeah. not talking about it. You're, yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you're just going over what's happened before and you're thinking more in depth about that argument, you know, that discussion yeah. you have, whatever. you think of what you're going to be doing. Yeah, your mind's yeah, yeah. just there. You're more mindful just generally. And yeah. now, pff, no, it doesn't happen. I um, When I run, I don't wear headphones. So like running, I'm in my thoughts, which is a good and a bad thing sometimes. <laughs> um, dog walking, tends to be in my thoughts. So yeah, I don't listen to music if I'm out and doing that sort of stuff. But you're right. If they you get it, then you get that opportunity. They're important yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's not meditation, is it? But it is. It's just letting your brain just sort of like roll through things and just 
just yeah. It's I just, think it's a big part of why the attention span of people has gone gone down the pan. Mm. I think you know you just look at the way social media is now. I mean, what you can thirty seconds a minute videos are uploaded and that's and if that if you're not grasping you know oh, as, yeah. as, as content you know, as, as a content maker if you're not grasping the person in the first five seconds you've lost them yeah because they're just flicking through you jesus christ is yeah. that it people don't even wait to hear like the fourth or fifth I word know. or read it and it's gone no yeah imagine being a marketing professional now in that world where you've got to try and get people's attention so i'd never seen reels before um but because i was three months in a hotel room in dubai i spent a lot of time on my own and I started looking at reels. Oh my God, that is the most addictive thing in the whole world. Is it just longer videos? Well, they're like, they can be anything from 10 seconds to about two minutes, but they're just all Instagram videos and they're all like little funnies and little sketches and or snowboarders jumping out of things or like, I'm obsessed by, I, I want a wingsuit now. That's why I'm going to start free falling and just watching people doing this cr cool like wing. But it like, it's super addictive because it's like 20 seconds at a time, next video, all over music. And yeah, I was in this hotel grot on my own and I realised I was wasting a lot of time watching reels, just lying on my pit at night when I could have been doing anything else. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. And, and it's that's not... really unlike me, and it sucked me right in. I've had to like properly disengage from it because otherwise, just sit there, just like monging it. So how do you manage me. it then? How do you how do you control yourself? I just I just make sure I don't do it now. I just so people can't do that. Try and exercise self control. People can't do that. Yeah. There are people that can't do it. Well, because these are designed to be addictive. They're designed to steal your attention, to steal minutes of your life. Like, does that? Uh, documentary on Netflix, um, The Social Dilemma. Oh, that, yeah. I watched that. I'm so glad I did because it terrified me and I've like properly made sure I... I've only watched half of it. I've watched it all. Yeah. I got distracted by my phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've not watched it all. But, um, I want to get I, I, I want to get on um, uh, a evolutionary biologist. All right. Um, yeah, I, I don't know who. I don't know any. No, but I want to get someone on. There's none in three para. <laughs> no, 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 the evolutionary. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, <laughs> we, um, no, we're fucking not. We lost my train of thought now. I, I want to discuss. I want to try. I want to try and get a handle on where they think where they think society is going. Like That'd where we're, what are we doing. Because, like you're saying, just with the phones and attention span, like, I say what in, in, in five years' time, we're going to be so different. Well, look at how different society is now. And if it's pattern of life, look, look at if you like to look at the street and mm. sit there for ten minutes, watch it now, and then go back to ten years ago, yeah, or or fifteen years ago, and watch the same street. You got it'd be like two different species. I know, yeah, two different species. Yeah, you look, you'd be looking at com acting completely differently. There's a there's a show on Radio Four at nine o'clock this morning. Uh, yeah, so it's actually I'm missing it now, but it was called We Broke Society. I'm going to try and get it on catch up. I heard it on the way up here. They talk about it. It's all about social media, the way we're all now behaving, the way we're all fighting each other online. We're all picking sides all the time and screaming and trolling. And it's it's called like We Broke Society. And I'm I'm going to I'm going to catch it on catch up on the way back down. Cause that, that sounds good. Yeah, because that's basically exactly what we're talking about. Like how how our ability to be completely connected to all this information and disinformation all the time and latch into it and... And not understanding the impact it has on... But basically being a wanker. Yeah. Like, I... I <coughs> be careful what I say you. I know a young person <laughs> who, uh, who... who posted something on on social media and it, I, I, I saw it and I was like, what on earth? Because I know that young person mm. in real life, and it's not the it's not like the personality that is portrayed on the social media yeah. is not the person that is in real life. And trying to, what I couldn't understand is how they didn't realize how that would be perceived by an actual person reading what was put on social media. Yeah, it's like, man, would you you wouldn't say that for real? Why have you mm. put it there? And it's almost like it, it doesn't. Yeah, but it's not a real thing. It's on social media. Mm. Would you say it in a job interview? Because I guarantee you, people will look at your social media. <laughs> like when I was employing people, I wish you do a quick, quick search, look through, see, you know, just it's it's open source information, isn't it? You know, and yeah, I mean, there's the, the there's lots of stuff going on in cricket right now. I'm not much of a cricket fan, but um, there was the young England cricketer, what about six months ago? And on the day of his first test, they uh, someone had obviously been sitting on it for ages. They pulled a load of tweets out that he wrote at two in the morning when he was eighteen. Um, which was whatever, how many years ago, 
but in this day and age, unacceptable. And I don't know if it ended his career, but it certainly ended his first test match. And yeah. What you put out there is there forever. Um, yeah, at the same time, though, yeah, you're right. But at the same time, though, like you said, 18 years old, two in the morning, whatever. If it's 5, 10, 15 years ago and you're blatantly not the same person, for God's sake, it goes back to the social media thing and yeah. the news thing, outrage and, and blah, 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 yeah. you know. Yeah, it, it's just, uh, there needs to be some kind of rational thinking from the employer when you look at it. You know, I, I, I constantly flap about the podcast. Yeah. Constantly flap about the podcast. My, as in me, content being out there, either me saying, having said stuff over, over the previous episodes, or the guests haven't said stuff, and merely because I, or I would be guilty by association. Yeah. I perceive you see it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Companies sack people. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying I would get sacked by uh, by by Inmars, huh? mm. but you, you just never know. The wrong person reads the wrong thing the wrong way, and all of a sudden, someone's perceived as being racist or sexist, and yeah. in the world where it's super inclusive and equality and all that, which I'm all for, there is sometimes such knee-jerk reactions that people lose their jobs, lose, lose their livelihood. Yeah. Their whole lives are turned upside down yeah. by stuff that it shouldn't happen for. One of the, one of the things, I probably didn't realise how stressful for it was, how stressful it was for me at the time, I do in reflection, although I did remember talking about it, was I hated being that public when I was a CEO at React. I hated the fear that that would bring nearly all the time. And it was it was another one of the reasons why I started to look at transitioning out because I just, the way society was going, the press was going, obviously I had loads of good experience with the press. I had that one really bad experience too. Um, and that was the most uncomfortable period of my life. And I was like, I'm never having this again. And I'm really lucky, like you're, you and I are basically the same age. We didn't have social media when we were 18, 19, 20. I'm really glad about that. Really, really glad about that. Um, but we were allowed to then be 18, 19, 20. We were allowed to be idiots because... That was the time back then, you know, it was 1998, wasn't it, 1999? Um, but I hated being so public and being yeah, being a, a white male CEO of a charity, that's a target round if, the, if they could find something wrong. And I just I didn't want to be up on hold anymore. I wanted to go back into doing work in the shadows quietly because <laughs> um, it's 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 quite scary out there now, isn't it? And, you know, it would be... James Haskells is writing some stuff about it right now, and he's obviously really public, and he's sort of trying to push back against cancel culture, which ironically means he's probably going to get cancelled. <laughs> I reckon. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Some good signs at the minute where people... It's not going to get as bad as sort of probably what you or I worried about, where mm. it goes, we actually... It beca it becomes... you 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 you. What you say and what you do is, is so heavily policed because you has to be so heavily policed by yourself because you just get sacked, which I thought we were going that way. But you look at things like Dave Chappelle's comedy. Do you know Dave Chappelle? No. Right. Dave Chappelle is um, he's one of the greatest comedians of all time. He's a, mm. a like that black black guy. I know. And, I, I do know who you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's just released a, doc, uh, a special on Netflix. And there's jokes in there that involve transgender parts of the joke. Mm. I think there's some homosexual stuff in there. Um, there's all, you know, there's, there's racial stuff in there, mm. race related stuff in there, the jokes. Um, and it's, it came to the news because a load of Netflix employees turned around and they did a protest outside mm. and can't take it down, take it off Netflix. And mm. Netflix, it, the Netflix CEO, I think it was, turned around and said, no, oh, it's like, leaving it up. Right. sort of comedy yeah but th so things like that he hasn't been cancelled I mean he's massive but he hasn't been cancelled mm. yet right I'd be very surprised if he does but I mean the thing with that is when you, if you wa it's worth watching it is, it is genius right? yeah. it, is, it is hilarious but when you watch it the only things that these people are protesting about there's no way they've watched they've no, there's no way they've watched it right because when you watch it it's not a, uh, it's not about slating the transgender community the gay community the flipping white white community sounds weird to say mm. isn't it? white community yeah, yeah, yeah. you know he's actually supporting them it's a really cl it's really clever me, me and the missus watched it again the other day and it's so clever at the, mm. at the end of it and they haven't watched it they've they've taken a five second they've seen a five second thing where he's laughing at something about a transgender person or whatever mm. and they've and they've um they've, they've just gone 
straight into outrage mode. Yeah. Whereas if they watch the whole thing, they go, oh, I did actually, they'd actually applaud it. So th yeah. it's things like that, I think, uh, maybe, maybe, we'll be all right. maybe we'll be all right. I hope so. There is I a bit of a backlash going against it. Isn't I it? hope we get back to a place where we can understand context. Um, because when you take things out of context, I'm not talking about race-related jokes or anything like that, just talking about anything. If you take anything out of context, it can make it completely different to what was actually said. And you can create outrage around it, and the press is really good at taking things out of context. And I hope there is a pushback against it. And I hope we can create a place again where... Because what happens is when, when everyone entrenches on either side of an argument, you get no healthy debate in the middle anymore. So you can't educate people anymore, you know, cause, because you can't have a debate without the fear of being called one thing or another. And I hope we get back to some kind of common sense where we can sort of discuss issues without it all be... Like mask wearing. <laughs> I mean, families were falling out, feuding over whether to wear a mask or not, or whether COVID was real or not, or to have a vaccine or not. You know, these aren't even the more complicated issues of like equality. These are just, just wear a mask, because it might help. <laughs> you know, we don't need to start calling people out and ruining friendships and families over that. No, but I think that's that's being caught. Yeah, I know what you mean. But it's, that's being caused by that's being caused by media and the, and the news. I think mm. there's a there is an argument to be had that says that all of this discontent and a lot of it, most of it, is being the genesis of it is coming from Rus Russian and Chinese influence. Well, that's right. Destabilizing De disinformation. UK, destabilizing USA. That'll be a big part of the battlefield in years to come. You know, they'll they'll be attacking social media fabric behind to start losing public interest in battles. Um, what's really interesting is being out in the UAE for a little while is there is none of this because there isn't the freedom of press there. It's quite an oppressive regime. And freedom of speech, freedom of the press is an important part of democracy when it was responsible you know, because actually it held people to account, it held government to account, institutions to account. But of course they're, they're now built around click rate and like that instant attention to get a click through sensationalist headlines so disinformation spreads or fake news spreads three times faster than real news which is just awful and but in the UAE there is none of this screaming at each other because it's illegal you can't you can't um you can't preach and cause hate and disturbance and it's very quiet and peaceful it's, it's oppressive you know it's not uh, it's not the freedom of speech but it's a much nicer place to be at the moment. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, where do we go? You know, <laughs> like you walk around the UAE, it's really friendly. You know, there's no, people hate screaming, there's no trolling on the internet. Because if you do that, then CID will be around within days to question you as to what you're up to and why you're trying to cause discontent. You don't see that over here. I mean, that's, you don't see that here though. That's the picture that's painted on social media and on like, and in the news is that everyone's at each other's throats all mm. the time and it's massive discontent. There is, but it's all online. Yeah, but you can't do it online in the UAE. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. You can't even do it on WhatsApp. So it just doesn't happen. Oh. Yeah, no, it's it's legit out there. You know, they are, they are monitoring everything and if you go too far, if you slag off the government you will get you will get questioned as to what you're up to sounds like a great way to live sharpie what are you trying yes, to say mate, i quite liked it <laughs> I, I quite liked it <laughs> you know yeah. yeah i'm reading uh, i'm reading stalin at the minute right right so um, ideas of leadership <laughs> yeah oh it, I, I so i'm trying to with everything that's going on i'm trying to form my own thoughts and just understand things and i, I don't I, like i don't really i don't really know what Communism is, socialism is. I, d I don't understand all that mm. at any level of depth. I've <clears throat> found this book called Stalin. Reading that, I tell you what, it's brilliant. Mm. It is flipping brilliant. It, about him from a kid. Right. So late, basically early, early 90s, the the Kremlin released um, uh, all of the old files that had been kept under lock and key until there was like a regime change there, basically. And a lot of it was to do with Stalin. And so this guy, Robert Service, did a mega in-depth mega in-depth research and then wrote the book but i remember opening the book and thinking hmm, i wonder if i'll get to anything in here and i'll see similarities of what's going on in this day and age it took me about 30 pages and it's got to a part where uh, so he was georgian by the way wasn't even russian All right what a bluffer sneaky, yeah. sneaky georgian <laughs> bastard he um He's got to a bit where he's in his early 20s. Marxism's, you know, he's he becoming an active a Marxism activist, if you want to call it that, in, in today's language. And they are in Georgia 
they are trying to rally employees against employers through outrage and right. misinformation and getting protests organised mm. and all that but uh, against uh, across the board to get discontent spread and so this, uh, eventually overthrow the regime. Yeah. And that's where the point I went, oh my God. Yeah. That's what happens. That is what's happening now. So what, what does it say? History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's quite because you know things just keep rechiming, don't they? Um, I, I read, I read in what was it, Telegraph, and it was comparing America now to Germany pre-Nazi, so pre pre nineteen forty, pre nineteen thirty, and they said that you potentially have a place now in America where one third of the population would murder the other one third, and one third might stand back and watch. You, you're potentially at that place in America with so much tension down, the bar, down down racial lines, down economic lines, down republic democratic lines. Th there's so much tension there, and there's so many guns. <laughs> A lot of guns, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. How interesting that what pans out there. They're just a different beast, aren't they? A different beast. The way. Um, the way they can. Uh, the, just how different each state is from each other. The way they they they. They go about things. I mean, the COVID, the COVID situation as an example. You know, yeah. some states just did nothing. Yeah, Flo did nothing. Florida, just Florida, did yeah. Wasn't there. yeah. And then you had other states that went crazy. New York. Yeah, but it's, they've laid off seventy odd thousand nurses now, haven't they? What New York? Yeah, because okay. they've. I think it's seventy odd thousand or fifty odd thousand because mm. they won't get the vaccine. Oh, and right, no. they're having to draft in national guard to plug the gaps. Yeah. Well, I, I think we'll probably find similar things here if they try to make the vaccine compulsory for social care workers. There were some debates on Radio 4 about this a few weeks ago where people said, well, I don't want the vaccine. And they said, well, you might not be able to work in the social care system then. <laughs> and, you know, I, th I don't think that problem's a million miles away from our doorstep yet. It's just America's already there. I think it was on the news this morning about whether the NHS workers would be mandated to have the vaccine and, and what that would or wouldn't do to nursing numbers. So I think we've got that problem still to come yet. That is a different conversation. Yeah, and it's one that I'm not educated <laughs> no. enough to have with you. You have this really like handy knack of putting me in really difficult <laughs> conversations and corners. I'm like, actually, mate, I don't know. I'm not a geopolitical expert. <laughs> um, right. Anything we haven't covered that you wanted to cover? No, mate. It's been good. How can people check out what the company's doing? Um, well, I'm still on LinkedIn. You're going to hit there. And there's a website, um, challenger, uh, challenger-ops.com. Um, but it's not going to be it's not going to be as big and public as React. Um, but we will be uh, we're just starting to pull together a, our first teams of consultants, which is uh, which is an exciting step for us because at the moment it's been Rob and I doing the work, and th now we've just got things starting to come. We start bringing some people in, and so I'll be reaching out uh, be reaching out to that React network a little bit, seeing who who fancies doing some more cool stuff in cool places. Um, so you know, watch this space on that. Are you going to pull your boots on for Forces Barbarians on the fourth of December? Fourth of December. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, President's, President's 15 versus Treasurer's 15. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Yeah. Uh, well, like I said, I was thinking about getting my rugby career back started again. Maybe this would be the yeah. catalyst. It's be good, mate. I'll have to be buy a, some boots. A bit, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit light hearted. Yeah. Be good. Be awesome. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sweet. Mate, Maga. Mate, thanks for having me. No awesome. worries. Anytime. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear if not if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, 
You also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.